I'm interested in in what the kind of upper level of ApoB is that we'd like to see for this young person. What do we want to see their ApoB fall under? And I think we spoke about 80 milligrams or 85 milligrams per deciliter previously as a kind of threshold. But the ESC guidelines, and I'll show a, a table, table 10 on screen here for anyone watching on YouTube, put into the show notes for those that are listening. In these guidelines, they they put forward different APO lipoprotein B targets and then the corresponding non-HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, depending on someone's uh, risk. And they suggest to target an APO lipoprotein B level of 80 milligrams per deciliter, which corresponds to 70 milligrams per deciliter for LDL cholesterol for people who are under 70 years old that are at high risk. Do you think that this should be the level that even low risk people should target? <laughs> this is a great discussion. Look, the, the goal, if you want to treat somebody, your goal of therapy should be to prevent this uh, chronic disease from ever developing. And our problem right now is all of those goals you just rattled off are based on 10-year risk assessments. So in other words, if I make your LDL, your ApoB here, in the next 10 years, are you going to get a heart attack? Well, unless you're 80 years old, very few people are going to have heart attacks in the next 10 years. But if we start rethinking about lifetime risk of atherosclerosis, then the levels that are going to induce an eight-year-old to a lifetime risk of atherosclerosis are going to be a lot lower than is this kid going to have a heart attack in the next 10 years. It would be the same with a 30-year-old man or woman. At what ApoB or LDL cholesterol do I worry about so I can ensure them, hey, for the next 10 years, you're not going to have an event. And at what ApoB, LDL cholesterol, can I look at them in the eyes and say, for the rest of your life, you're never going to have an atherothrombotic event. So more and more in the paper you just cited today uh, that came out, we're starting to reevaluate and look at lifetime risk assessment. For the same reason I tell you to stop smoking when you're 12 years old. I don't wait. I smoke for 30, 40 years, and then I'll tell you to stop it because half your lungs will be destroyed and you might have cancer by then. So I don't want your arteries to ever develop. I don't want you to be one of those I don't want you to be a soldier has to fight a war, but I don't want you to get run over by a car and they find out you had coronary artery disease or God forbid you had a coronary event at a young age uh, because you never got your lipids checked. So th these artificial numbers that they come up with, uh, you know, what are you looking to do? Prevent a heart attack in 10 years or lifetime re re uh, reduction of risk of heart attacks? Uh, and that will choose what you want. Now, interesting, if I like to look at it First of all, what I'm going to tell you is going to tell you two things, that there's no such thing as a low ApoB can hurt you. So do you really care how much I lower your ApoB or cholesterol metric that correlates with ApoB? When children come out of mom's womb and they take, yay, and they start crying, uh, if we measured their, and remember, they just spent nine months in the womb having the most explosive growth development, brain development that they will ever have, and they come out with LDL cholesterols of 20 and ApoBs of 30. And, and oh my God, because if I made uh, an adult patient LDL cholesterol 20, they have a heart attack. They go on the internet and say, I'm going to die tomorrow. That's funny. It's not killing all these kids that are coming out of their moms of cholesterol deficiency. If we then take the five-year-old, and let's repeat, the ApoB is 50 milligrams per deciliter. And that kid has gone through the tremendous growth spur, the brain development of childhood. His brain probably stops growing when he's five years old, you know. But the low cholesterol levels, the low ApoB did not stunt the kid's growth, did not stunt his adrenal function. We won't know about his gonads until he hits puberty, but trust me, it's not going to screw up his gonads by the time he can start using them. So we we just have to stop fearing that make these low metrics are dangerous in any possible way. Uh, these kids with such low ApoB and L are not dying of malnutrition or anything else. So when... Ideally, then, as Peter Libby has said in some of his pub, that's the physiologic ApoB concentration, 30 to 40. The physiologic LDL cholesterol level is 10 to 30. 
And if we could all, by some miracle, maintain LDL cholesterols of 10 to 30, ApoBs of 30 to 40, there can't possibly be atherosclerosis, LP little a aside. Uh, and uh, how do we know that? Be by some of the genetic diseases that teach us that. And there's two I want to talk about. The first, I've mentioned the word PCSK9. PCSK9 is a protein that destroys your LDL receptors. LDL receptors is what pulls your ApoB particles out of plasma into the liver for catabolism. So you want to have a lot of LDL receptors. If you do, you'll never have a high ApoB. But PCSK9, once the LDL receptor comes into the liver, PCSK9 destroys it. So if you or liver destroys your LDL receptors, you can't clear ApoB particles. Your ApoB level is through the stratosphere. People with genetic, it's called gain of function of PCSK9. They overproduce PCSK9, have no LDL receptors. It's one of the causes of familial hypercholesterolemia. They have significantly premature atherosclerotic disease. But there's another group who God liked. And he gave them loss of function of PCSK9. They can't make PCSK9. Their liver cannot destroy its LDL receptors. Their LDL receptors' half-life is extended. They clear LDL particles like there's no tomorrow. They go through life with LDL cholesterols of 10 to 20, ApoB levels of 30, there's virtually no evidence of atherosclerosis in these people. And better yet, there's no evidence of any cholesterol deficiency in these people. So, wow. The other genetic defect, not quite as potent, but it all moves in the same direction. We absorb cholesterol from our gut lumen into the intestine, which sends it into the liver. The, the receptor that pulls cholesterol from the gut lumen into the enterocyte is called the neiman pick c one like one receptor, NPC1L1. It grabs cholesterol molecules, it pulls them in. If you don't have NPC1L1, meaning you have genetic loss of function of the gene that controls, you can't absorb cholesterol in your gut. Those people have low LDL cholesterol, and they have a drastically lower incidence of atherosclerotic heart disease as time goes on. Now, their LDL cholesterol isn't as low as the loss of function of PCSK9. It's maybe 15 milligrams per deciliter lower than what the average person would have. But over a lifespan, simply having LDL cholesterol reduced by 15 milligrams per deciliter translates into no heart disease. So we have two genetic, and the cool thing is now, for us lipidologists who are into therapeutics, if you weren't born with the right genes, I have a PCSK9 inhibitor that will do exactly loss of function and gene does. If you didn't, if you don't have loss of function of neiman pick, I've got a drug called azetamide, which takes out the neiman pick c one like protein and causes hypoabsorption of cholesterol. Both of those drugs have now been proven to reduce the incidence of atherosclerotic disease, make the arteries look better on imaging. So it's... The genetic, you know, if we knew the genetic stuff years ago, it would have been so easy to discover what drugs you have to invent. That <laughs> came later. So if we're, if we're looking at, and I appreciate what you're saying is lower the better, there's no real downside to... And sooner the better. Yeah. Those people, their LDL is low at birth. Right. So sooner the better, lower the better. We see that from these genetic studies. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the cholesterol years, thinking about lifetime exposure to these apob containing lipoproteins so let's say early in life we measure someone tom and their um, apob is 65 or 70 milligrams per deciliter so it's kind of below that threshold but it's not super super low it's not where they would have their apob level at birth um is is there like when would there be an indication for uh, drug therapy, like what, what's that sort of threshold where you'd be thinking, okay, I'd actually like to get this ApoB lower. Yeah. So what we do then is we look at our epidemiological studies, the clinical trial data, even some of the Mendelian data we have, and we, we see these are not these genetic freaks who've been blessed with the great genes, but we still have to sooner or later start respecting ApoB in them at what level. So what we do now is we use what we call population percentile cut points. 
So if I took everybody in the world and measured, let's say, ApoB on them, you're going to have some people have really, really low ApoB. Some of them will be genetic. Some will be whatever. Probably genes we haven't discovered yet. And then there will be the nightmares on the right side of the bar where, oh, my, their uh, ApoB is in the stratosphere. And then it's a bell-shaped curve. There will be some people right in the middle. So who do we worry at? So with ApoB, below 60 would be you're in the bottom fifth percentile of the human population. Not many people with ApoB below 60 ever get heart attacks, and especially the longer it's been under 60. I mean, if your ApoB has been 200 and next month I make it 60, you've still had 50 years of exposure to ApoB, but you get the point. And likewise, if I start to see, wow, your ApoB is like above 120, that's the 80th percentile. That's the heart attack zone. So if you came up to, even a young person came to me and their ApoB was in the 80th percentile, I'd have to talk seriously to them or if they are still adolescents to their parents and convince them that now is the time we're going to start trying to do what we can do pharmacologically. If you see there are lifestyle issues, you will certainly educate them on all of those things too, all crucial and important. You'd watch their blood pressure. You obviously wouldn't let them smoke. But that's, I think, at an 80th percentile ApoB, pretty much adolescence and above, you have to start considering treatment nowadays because it's this ApoB years that we're really worried about. So, so how about now you're, what's the 20th percentile? And that would be with an ApoB of around 80 milligrams per deciliter. So most physicians nowadays, if you didn't have six other cardiovascular risk factors, you're not a diabetic, you're a mom, dad, and uncle Joe didn't croak when they were 22 years old of a heart attack. So you have less, they're not hypertensive little kids or young adults. You would probably be happy with an ApoB of 80. Uh, it starts to hit around 100. Uh, I'm, you come to me, a lipidologist who believes this sort of LDL years, I'm going to, you're my son, you're going on a drug with an ApoB of 100. If it, it, look, if you've got the worst lifestyle in the world, you would always try that for X number of months and see what you can do. So those are sort of the numbers. I, I think if you had an ApoB of 100, 120, and you're in this so-called early primary prevention uh, phase, we would try and make it 80. I don't know that I would try and blow it down to 40. I could with today's drugs, but that might be overkill. But I'd watch you closely. And at a certain age, you know, imaging is not good early in life. You can start doing it later in life to see, my God, is there plaque that we didn't realize? Some people use the carotid imaging, which is non-invasive and very easy to do. And Certainly carotid irregularities would show up before a coronary calcium test turned positive. So there are other ways of more seriously investigating a patient. So um, there's no set rules. Everything is, you know, you do a really super family history, you examine the patient, and you also get a feel. You know, if you're a good dog, you know this person could be ready to die next week and they would never take a drug even if you suggested it to them so you know you have to be careful you, you can't come out not talk to anybody and say here's two prescriptions start them tomorrow